So that was very good. Um, anyhow, uh, we got a couple of emails. Uh, and I, I always think of, do you remember the Perry Como show years ago? Yeah. They used to sing letters. We get letters. And so we get emails. And, uh, I said, the first one is from somebody named J.M. I'm not sure where the person is from, but I thought that, that the email was nice, nice, so I thought I'd share with you. He says, I've written before to let you know how appreciated you are. I visit your site daily for new insights or to be re ruminate past or more recent thoughts. You are the first person I know of to logically pull together scientific facts and make sense from rope fiction and present it in an easy, accessible way for the masses. My problem is that I just don't understand the meditation process. Please write a 101 handbook for us dummies because it must be at this point for me just to step away. Many, many thanks. So that, you know, that was. The next one comes from Hawaii, from a place called Kihai in Hawaii, from somebody named Joan. She said, thanks, Bill, for not spreading doom and gloom and fear. It's hard to get the so-called facts of all this previously hidden info and deception of the world as we've been led to believe when so much of it is cloaked in the messenger's political agenda, anger, and fear. You weave it in a new way that invokes curiosity and wow, so new awareness can automatically take place. And that's nice from Hawaii. Uh, uh, there's another one. The next one's from Hawaii, too. Uh, Aloha. Uh, thank you so much for what you're doing and the way you present it. You're providing much needed service to humanity and on a personal note, providing me with an avenue to share these re revelations, earth world changes, without worrying about just triggering fear in a newly awakening person. My words cannot express how deeply I appreciate your work. Aloha, Joan. Now, I don't know if she was saying t aloha to you or if her. And we have one more. That was the same person. That was the end of that letter. Oh, it was? Was it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, you should have told me that. <laughs> but the next one is from India. Ooh. And it's Mukhi Shinai of Angrahara, Karnataka, India. Amazing, mind-boggling, and loads of info which can never be found anywhere else, nor anyone will dare to venture in such a matter. My salutation to you for having pain stickling with perseverance and patience to have accumulated such a huge amount of data and having the thought of publishing on the net for the benefit of mankind. Keep up with the good work. My good wishes are always there with you. Someday I would like forward to see you in person and have a hug with a personality called Bill. God bless. Take care. Keep smiling. And cheer up. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's very, um, you know, I still go, every time I see something like that, you know, India, I go back to say we were thinking back in the days, and we thought, you know, we know all this stuff, but we don't have anybody to tell, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, you know it's not that way anymore. So uh, it's it's really really good. Would I like you to bring me some water? I think that would be nice. Yeah, you bring water. I mean, uh, I think it'd be very nice. Uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I, I introduced you to two professors who uh, work at the University of Virginia. And these professors uh, from the University of Virginia center their studies on an interesting subject. Let, let me just introduce them to you again. OK, keep hitting. There it is. This is, this is Professor Jim Tucker. And we'll do the other one. And one more time, and that's Professor Dr. Ian Stevenson, and they're the <coughs> University of Virginia Health System Division of Personality Studies. Now, what's interesting about their work is they have great credentials, and their studies from a you know a very great university uh, are in the field of uh, in the field of past lives focusing mainly on the things children say that can be traced to a past life. Uh, what's interesting about them is they don't just uh, take somebody and say, oh, my child said this. What they have to do in order to be able to uh, really do work on it is the child has to say something specific or identify something specific. 
and then they check it and they'll track it, uh, the names, the location, and so forth, and they reach a conclusion that, you know, these children who say these strange things that we hear them say are speaking from an experience in, in, an, in a past life. Uh, Dr. Jim Tucker um, made uh, this statement, which, which was an interesting one. <coughs> he said, there's one case here in Charlottesville, that's in Virginia, and the only thing the child ever said to the mom about it was, one day they were driving down the road and the little boy says, in my last life, I drove a big truck. Of course, that was <coughs> completely unverifiable. But you know, you get statements like that, and then in cases that are useful to investigate, you get a lot of specific detail. So what he's saying was, in this particular case, the child was saying, in his last life, he drove a big truck, but there was no way to verify, because there was nothing else said. And there was, there, there, you know, there, there is nothing that you can go out and document about where it was or who it was. But as he says, on many other cases, you get a lot of specific details. See, so as, as we uh, focused on their work a couple of weeks ago, uh, we found stunning documentation from statement made by children who were able to provide specifics in their past lives. And, and, and Dr. Tucker said he, because of this work, has come to the point of being a believer. He said, but I'm not a Buddhist. I'm not a Hindu, he said, I don't push from a religious angle, but there is something here. So in other words, what he was trying to say was this really has nothing to do with spirituality, it has nothing to do with religion, it has to do with scientific fact. And that is that coming out of the mouths of children are revealed things that document and confirm past lives. Uh, which, you know, is an amazing thing. Of course, uh, we've all had that situation where we've seen things as children or we've talked to people or we've said things and for the most part we were ignored or if it got too much we are saying, well, you know, don't be doing that now or, you know, we'll take you to the, the, the pastor or something, you know, some crazy stuff like that. So children are basically... Uh, 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 what, their, their brains are washed away from that kind of thing. And that's a part of the problem. What we miss uh, and what we have missed is absolutely astounding. To me, my personal opinion is there is something either terribly wrong with nature or we have blown something at, beyond... Uh, where we, we should not have, and I'm stumbling for words because what I'm trying to say is I cannot understand how nature will give you a mother, a sister, a brother, a father, an aunt, an uncle, a close friend, and have that person's body uh, break down to where it's no longer usable, and then that personality vanishes into, into God knows what, you know, into like the ether, and we are told by people with robes on uh, that if we be good, we'll join them uh, on streets of gold in some crazy place. You know, it, it doesn't make any sense to me that nature would operate that way. Because in, in every other instance, you know, we see nature acting out its work uh, totally differently. I mean, the, the tree, uh, you know, it, it, it blossoms and then it for all appearances sake, dies, and then blossoms again. I mean, there's always this repetition of life. Yet, we have lost people very close to us that we love, and we, we would just love to be able to sit down and talk to them, and yet we're cut off like that, zap. Uh, and, and, you know, some people go through the terrible agony of a slow death in a hospital. Other people just, it's even worse. They're killed in an accident, and the shock goes... And then it's the end of it. And I, 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 you know, I could never deal with that being uh, the way nature intended because it just does never seem to me that nature operates this way. But when we talk about these types of situations and we talk about 
what comes out of the mouth of children. I mean, most of the time, I mean, just about all of the time, except for Dr. Tucker and Dr. Stevenson, uh, you'll see people taking past life studies uh, from adults, uh, you know, who for the most part have forgotten everything. Uh, yeah, I'm going to take you back to this, I'm going to take you back to that. And nobody's ever really been able to genuinely come up with anything to say, yes, and this is really true. This person was such and such in a past life. Uh, what you were in your past life, you knew as a little child. But it, it became like a little mystery thing inside of your little head that y you, you played with and, and talked with. And, and, but you couldn't tell anybody. And then you, you went to your school and your church, and, and they made sure that any kind of stuff like that was was scraped and washed out of your mind. Uh, so then by the time you get to be a robot and, and you follow them and kneel when they say kneel and sit when they say sit and sing when they say sing and all, then you don't know what the hell's going on. And then they come to you and say, well, you know, we'll do a past life. It's too late. And that's where they're coming from. It has to be with the child, say, because the child will turn right out and tell you, you know, where they were in a past life, what they did, who they knew, and, and all of these things. But, you know, it's so frustrating because if a child says something today, nobody follows up on it. Oh, you know, they're just in a little fantasy. And we don't realize that what they're saying is true, and that's where this guy is following through. Now, when we talk about the little child being the source of information about, you know, reality of life and past lives and all this kind of business, uh, the, the statement made by Jesus in the book of Matthew in the Bible is significant. He says in Matthew 18 too, and Jesus called a little child to him and set him in the midst of them, and he said, unless you be converted and become as little children, you'll never enter into the kingdom. Because you have got to be able to be free to fantasize. You have got to be able to be free to imagine and, and to be free uh, you know, to, to talk with yourself or talk to the trees, whatever, whatever like little kids do. And, and as adults, we can't do that. We're not allowed to do that. And so we miss all of, all of this kind of, of thing. And we miss the most important thing, and that is a contact with the loved ones who have uh, gone. And, 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 you know, the amazing thing is <coughs> they didn't go anywhere. Their bodies broke down, you know. And so they, the persons that operated those bodies, had to get out of them. But they're here. They're, but how do we get in touch with one another, see? And we're afraid of it. We're frightened of it. Uh, and people will come up and say, oh, you know, don't go there. They talk about communicating with the dead. I don't want to communicate with any dead. These people aren't dead. Their bodies died. They didn't. See? But, but you, can't, you can't get that through. But, you see, unless you get out of church, which is for adults, and unless you get out of the Bible, which is for adults, and unless you, uh, you get out of all these rules and regulations and politics and traditions and become as a little child, you'll never be able to figure it out. So you've got to be open to all of this type of, of, of fantasia almost, all of this, this type of, of what we call as adult spirit, but not spirit evoked by you having to play you know, an organ or something, but the real lesson of you know, being able to commune, being able to see strange things and not being afraid of it. And I found that one of the interesting statements that uh, Dr. Tucker made in our last study was this. He said, consciousness is not just a byproduct of a physical brain, but is actually a separate entity in the universe that has a big impact on things in the universe. So what he's saying is that consciousness exists, you know, outside of the brain. I mean, the brain receives from consciousness. It is not consciousness that receives from the brain. So when you have your sister or your mother or your father or your uncle or somebody, whomever it is that died, their physical body shut down, but they who are consciousness were, you know, went on to exist outside of that body. 
And we have never learned how to communicate with those outside of the body because we've been instructed not to. We've been instructed, and we even take it down to the little children. Even when the children spin like the whirling dervish, oh, stop that, you're going to, you know, dizzy. Not realizing that this is part of their real close touch with nature. Here's a, another thing he said. There are people looking at the idea of how, in a quantum way, consciousness can affect the physical brain. If you're open to that possibility, and that's a big if you're open, if you're open to that possibility, if you're truly going to consider the fact that consciousness is that separate entity in the universe, then you have to consider the possibility that consciousness is not dependent on just being a byproduct of a functioning brain. It's going to continue after the brain dies. You see? Now, you know, you don't come in here and to listen to preachers and all of this. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you people who study this stuff the reason he can say that, he certainly doesn't look like a radical person. The reason he can say this is because he has worked with Dr. Stevenson. They have checked things out from children who have said where they were in a previous life, and they went and they checked and they found out things that confirmed it. And he said, without any, any doubt, it, it is, you reach a conclusion that consciousness, you and me, our personalities continue after the brain dies. But my problem with it is that nobody ever told us that before. Would you, how old are you? Did you have to wait all these years to come in here to hear that? You never heard it from the church. Never. Never have you ever heard it from the church. It's the same way that I have suggested to you over and over that consciousness continues after the brain goes to sleep. It's the same thing. The brain is the physical part. Consciousness is the living part. Consciousness is who you are. You're conscious inside of this body. You know? But once you get outside the body, when the body dies, how do you communicate with a person inside of a body? In other words, if you were to die, how do you communicate with somebody very close to you? See? Because you're, you're outside of a body, they're operating from a standpoint of a, 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 of a, of a material brain and material wiring. How do you, how do you, how do you two communicate? <coughs> There's a way. <coughs> but we, we've never, ever looked at that. Religion has never been able to come to grips with that premise about the, the consciousness being outside of the body, and they focused on the physical body and what happens to it after it dies. You see? And right now, uh, the big thing in the church is they're going to ex excommunicate scientists who work with stem cells. It, it, you know, uh, and absolutely, uh, w b scientists who are trying to cure cancer, Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, all these terrible things are using something that is God-given and God-created and they're going to be kicked out of this group, you know, because the emphasis from the group is not on the consciousness which has not entered a stem cell, but on the physical part of it. The stuff. The stuff is what it is. Stuff. Yeah? To say a stem cell is a human being is like saying a tire is a car. It's not until all the other parts are assembled together. Then you go out and say, I'm going to drive my car. But if you're going to come down with a tire and Albert's going to roll his tire into the parking lot, say, oh, hey, what do you like this? Oh, yeah, Ethel drives it. That doesn't make any sense. The fact that the body decays after it dies and should no longer be a subject of interest eludes them. It is the invisible. And I mean, we all do it, you know, and I, you know, I don't knock, knock in anybody's business, but people have to pile in, and I guess out of respect, but they look at this thing laying in the box, you know. Well, <laughs> the problem is it's not the person. The person's not there. It's like going, if let's go down to Cosmo's junkyard, maybe we can find your old car, and then we'll all kneel down next to it. You're not in it. You're not there. You're someplace else. Another very convincing proof of, of this, if you want to call it reincarnation, was made by Dr. Ian Stevenson. H his research is very interesting. 
Dr. Stevens' research also deals with physical birthmarks. I don't know how many of you have a birthmark, but what Dr. Stevenson did was he would take children who would talk about uh, an event that happened to them where they were injured in some way or other. And uh, he would look at uh, the um, uh, birthmark that they had, you know, um, or a physical deformity. Uh, and in some cases, he's been able to look up autopsy records of a previous person. The child will say, I lived in um, Chicago and such and such. And they'll remember all of this stuff. And I, you know, had this happen or I had that happen. So, you know, you can be a skeptic about this. But you will be a skeptic for only one reason. Do you know why you're skeptical of this? You're skeptical because you have had your training from religion. If you didn't have your training from religion, you wouldn't be skeptical. A child is not a skeptic. A child says, hey, I talked to this person. This person came in the room and left, and I talked to it. Oh, yeah, okay, well, yeah. But they're telling you something that really happened because they're not a skeptic. They're open, see? A child just receives and tells us what they know. And unless you come as a child, you'll not be able to take part in all of the excitement of life and what God has given to us all, see? I mean, you know, I had my, I was on the phone with my brother. Um, and he's had some difficult times in, in, in a hospital and so forth. And he told me, and Joan, that he saw my sister, who had passed away, and, and she waved to him. Well, you know, I could uh, take what would be the normal thing and say, yeah, okay, Bob, well, you know, you keep taking your pills. And, you know. But we got all excited and said, and said, wow, that's terrific. We haven't seen, she hasn't been in touch with us. Do you understand where I'm coming from? Why should I, if he saw her, he saw her, see? Why should he tell me that if he didn't? And, and why do I have to, you know, subvert my, my mind and my brain to these lunatic religious groups that want to take all of the excitement, all of the joy, all of the fun, and all of the reality of God and the invisible world away from us, see? So Dr. Tucker and Dr. Stevenson have impeccable credentials. They're not trying to make any point. They're studying, and they're investigating, and they're telling us. But they, you know, they don't come sitting down. You have, to go, you have to go find this stuff. They don't come sitting down. They're not going to come out on a TV show with somebody and say, hey, you know, we talked to these kids who lived in the past, and we... Pr Why? Because of ridicule. What happened to William Crooks? William Crooks, the most renowned scientist of the 19th century, said this woman came back from the dead, Katie King. Well, he was made out to be a, a complete buffoon because people are so inundated with this religion, which has done what? What has religion done? It has done nothing but cause people to kill each other. That's all it's accomplished. People kill each other over it. So the only reason in the world why people would uh, doubt Dr. Tucker or Dr. Stevenson is because of religion, which is the troublemaker all over the world. I want to show you another situation. Um, remember, either you accept Dr. Stevenson's credentials, and um, you know I didn't, I didn't go after them today. We did a couple weeks ago because you know, I wanted to try to move on. But he has impeccable credentials. He is a a teacher and a, and a doctor and a scientist at a prestigious University of Virginia, as is Dr. Tucker. Okay? Now, either you, you accept his credentials or you don't. But what he is saying is certainly consistent with what we've learned in the past from David Deutsch of uh, Oxford University in England and Max Tegmark from uh, University of Pennsylvania and the rest of the scientists we have studied recently. Let me show you something. This is a, a chest of a, a young boy and, and, and an x-ray thing. This young boy has an unusual birthmark. That's a birthmark right there, okay? That boy uh, 
had past life memories and, and Dr. Stevenson worked with him. He had this birthmark on his chest that looked almost like scars, but he gave the name of a person that he was in a past life. It was a young child. Dr. Stevenson tracked down the name and found the autopsy report for that person. In looking at the autopsy report, he found that the person that this boy said he was in a previous life had been killed by a shotgun blast to the chest right where he has that birthmark. The pattern of holes in the autopsy looked very much like the boy's birthmark. So what happened here, and, and these are the cases that Stevenson and, 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 and Tucker go after. What happened is the boy knew his name in a previous life, and Dr. Stevenson looked up the name, found the autopsy and the gunshot wound that killed the man, and matched the uh, uh, diagram on the autopsy report of the entrance of the, of the shot to this uh, birthmark that this boy had. So that's the way that Dr. Stevenson works with these situations in each case of a children's past life memory. They methodically document the child's statements. I mean, you know, I can hear preachers and pastors and all of these people, but I, you know, I'm much more comfortable working with two professors, doctors and scientists at the University of Virginia than I am with any of these people from the church or what's happening now. I, you know, it, it makes no sense even to lis listen to that kind of stuff. Stevenson even matches birthmarks and birth defects to wounds and scars on, on deceased people, verifies by medical records, and his strict methods systematically rule out all possible normal explanation for a child's memories. If a child cannot be specific a, a, about you know, a, a past life, then they go on to the next person. So it's not everybody, and I don't know how many they have. but you know. So the point being, however is that what he's found has been documented and is true, which means that indeed these doctors at the University of Virginia have proved that we have other lives. And yes, that there are parallel universes. Yes, that we have twins in parallel universes. And if we ever get the courage to reject religion, then we're going to be able to find God. Then we're going to be able to take part in all of these neat things. And then we're going to be able to reconnect our lives and with the lives of those we have physically known and loved and whose bodies have broken down uh, in, this, in this existence. Now, when we consider these things about past lives. And that's where Dr. Tucker and Dr. Stevenson work. Uh, th th they're focusing on children who speak of having lived before, you know, past lives. When we consider past lives, many, again, want to suppress this. Oh, I can't listen to this because I'm a born-again Christian. But I'll tell you something. It's absolute nonsense to say you can't Consider this because you were a Christian. Because if you were really a follower of Christ, then you would have to consider this. Let me show you why. Here in John 9, 1, Jesus passed by. I mean, he's walking. He saw a man who was blind from his birth. So this man is born blind. Okay? His disciples say, who did sin? Was it this man or his parents that he was born blind. So the disciples of Jesus then, unlike the disciples of Jesus today, believed that there was a pre-existing life. There was a past life and people did things. And so they asked him, and Jesus said, no, this man didn't sin and his parents didn't, but the works of God should be displayed in him. The point was, he didn't say, what do you mean past life? I don't teach that. I'm Jesus. I'm a Christian. Well, that, you know, he, he did teach that. And he obviously taught his disciples that because they asked him, well, what are you talking about? Uh, you know, uh, here, this guy is born blind. Now, somebody did something wrong in the past life that caused that. Was it he himself 
who caused himself to be born into this new life blind. So, in other words, past life is very okay and was taught as far as the Jesus of the Bible was concerned with his disciples. So after all of our studies about past lives, twins in parallel universes, here we see that the Bible supports the same belief because if there was no past life, there would be no way that the conversation could be involved with a person questioning whether that person did something wrong to cause himself to be born blind into this new life. Now, all of this, I don't know about you and how deeply you get involved in it, but it makes the whole situation, to me anyhow, very frustrating. Frustrating because there's no reason that we should not still be in touch with the people that we have loved and who have, whose bodies have died, whether they be family or friends. There is no reason why we should not be able to communicate with them. I mean, uh, God, you can communicate with someone with a cell phone uh, who's in Hawaii or, 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 or Germany or Italy or Japan or wherever, and you can stand in this room and through the air and everything, uh, the person's voice comes and there's no wires and uh, you know, was, we're able to do that, but in this little higher thing, we're talking about communication with a person's personality, the electro person, and we're not able to do it. And we're not able to do it because it can't be done. We're not able to do it because we've been hindered by the dark ages, middle ages superstitions of religion. There is no doubt in my mind that we are separated from loved ones not by death, but by our own persistence in following what we consider to be traditional religion, which is scared to death about the invisible life that is so close to us that we should be in touch with now. We've not broken through the thin veil that separates us from right here where somebody you love very much is standing. We should be at a point of meeting face to face. Now let me show you something. In 1 Corinthians, uh, the Apostle Paul makes this statement which reflects the possibilities. 1 Corinthians 13, now that, that's supposed to be the Apostle. I have no idea, but it was some guy's idea, with me, so that's fine. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now, we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. In other words, you know, we, we really don't know. We're, we're looking around and trying to figure out what. But there will come a time when it will be just as clear as can be. Now, I am known in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Okay? Now, it, it's, it's a short statement, but let's, let's say, we're not talking about face-to-face -face as you would conceive face-to-face, -face, okay? Face-to-face -face is, I've got a face, you've got a face, we look at each other face-to-face. -face. I laugh, you laugh, uh, you know, all this kind of stuff. This is contact in a realm that our physical selves cannot intentionally make, okay? You can communicate with those deceased whom you love face to face, meaning a contact in the realm above the normal physical which restricts life to the five senses. They don't have that body anymore. So your sister or your brother or your father or your mother or your grandfather, they don't have that body anymore. That's in the dirt somewhere or out in the ocean or wherever it went. So they're not going to look like that. Say. So what you have to do is then communicate with the invisible person, forgetting about your physical body, communicate with them. They're still the same person without the body. Can you imagine? Think of somebody that you've loved who has died. And think of them, if you can, the same person, the same personality without the body. They don't have that body. Now think of yourself without your body. Just like when you go to sleep. You know, your body, your brain separates from your body. I mean, 
Where are you then? But still you communicate with people. Even when you're sound asleep, you're communicating with a lot of people all the time. Tonight you'll be involved with a whole bunch of different people. Okay? And yet, none of them will have a physical body. Same way here. So how do you do this? Say, my sister just died recently. If I wanted to communicate with her, I have to forget about what she looked like. And that's what holds me up now. I'm thinking of her as she looked. I have to forget that. Because the body that was her is gone. That's, that's that. That was made by the mother and father that we shared. So she is not going to... I have to... But I, she is the same person. It's just like if I talk to her on the telephone, you know, I hear her and we talked about things and I didn't see her. So it's basically something like this, see? Face-to-face -face meaning a contact with her or you with a contact with somebody and you know for sure that contact was made. Now look at that line that says, I shall know even also as I am known. What is being said is, you shall know the person on the other side in the same way that you are known. Known to who? Known to those in what we consider the invisible dimension. They know you, see, in a different way than you know yourself because you, you know, you're a physical person, uh, warts and all, you know, and all of that. Not, but but they're, they're, they're this realm of consciousness, this mind consciousness. So we're still focusing on them in their physical form. If we can lay that aside, forget what that loved one of yours used to look like. Don't do that. Try to do something we've not been able to do is come to grips with their electronic per presence, their personality, their mind, their consciousness, their mind that went with them when the physical body stopped. Remember what the doctor said, consciousness is not encased in the brain, it's outside. So we have to understand what the invisible mind dimension is. It comes down to this. What is God? How can God be known? If God somehow can be known, then obviously your loved one on the other side can be known and know you. Once we understand that, then we'll understand how your loved ones who have passed on can be known. Let's look at the, at the Bible here. Numbers 23, 19. Now this is the critical thing. We're going to try to know this presence in... Uh, in the invisible realm. Now, it's going to be very hard because our religion has told us this is our Father, our Heavenly Father. And He's portrayed with a beard. And He's reaching down with His finger. To the, he doesn't have any fingers. And He doesn't have any beard. He doesn't have any head. He doesn't have anything. And yet He's there. Uh, 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 he is uh, sexual in you. It's there. It's there. How do I know? Well, I mean, what do we got? That's all we got. The Bible, as far as from this end of it is concerned, says God is not a man. Not a human being. So we can take that out. You can look right over here in this corner, and there, there's God. Not a man. Not a human being. No problem. Now, let's take it to the next step. 1 John 1, 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, God is light. Is, is it getting too cold in here for you? No. Okay. God is light. What that means is, this is an electronic person. Exactly like Tucker and those guys were saying. It's consciousness outside of a body. It doesn't have any brain. It doesn't have any fingers. It doesn't have any stuff. It's just there, but it's conscious. So now, just accept the fact that it's there, has no physical entity, but yet in this electronic invisible realm, there's an intelligence there. How do you communicate with it? How does, how does it communicate with you? No, no, see, the same way that's your loved one, your grandfather, your father, your mother, whatever, no more body. They left the bodies here. So you're going to have to communicate with the same person, but 
no body. How do you do that? See? We can't know God in the physical form without any arms or legs or no face or anything. So you've got to be prepared to know in a different way. And you have to be prepared to be known in a different way. Because your, your physical body is going to mean nothing. It, it, it's the inner communication is going to be electrical to electrical. See, you're not trying to make contact with the dead because they're not dead. I do not go into, I do not go into funeral parlors <coughs> and walk up and stand at the box. I never go near the box. Because if I go near the box, <coughs> that's in some way <coughs> meaning that I'm acknowledging the person. Well, I, person. And I hear people say, oh, did he look good? If he looked good, he wouldn't be in that box. <laughs> See? But I know that the person who we loved or who we respect so much is not in the box. So God is light. And here's the kicker. You are created in the image and likeness of God. Okay? Which means if God is light, you are light. God is consciousness. God is hope. God is understanding. God is love. God is peace. God, all of these things, that's you. See? Your body is created in the image and likeness of your mother and father. Some people, maybe in this room, it was a mistake. They didn't expect it. And God didn't have anything to do with it. There was a big fight after. So there you are, and that part communicates with one another on the physical realm, but the other part of you that stays in his existence forever communicates in a different realm. See? So we have to forget about the flesh and bone part of, of these people that we knew. Once we have somebody, a loved one, pass on, we have to cease thinking of them in a physical form for purposes of contact and think in an entirely different way. In other words, the normal physical body cannot see the activity in the realm of light. If you look over here, you cannot... If you look around this room, do you know what? I told you this time. Do you know what? You look around this room, you don't see anything, do you? Except me. Do you know there are buffalo running through here? Do you know there are soldiers shooting at you? Do you know there are bullets going right through your head? Do you know that there are girls doing unseemly things right in front of you? Do you know that there are men doing unseemly things? Do you know that there are baseball players hitting balls right through your head? All of this is happening. And I could prove it because if I got a little TV set with a pair of rabbit ears, I'd show you a picture of it. And it's coming right through here. You can't see it. You can't see it. You need a special connection in order to be able to see it. Bingo, same thing. You need a special connection in order to be able to see it because it's high above any of the channels that you have on your TV set in order to make contact. So even if that person that you love has entered into a new physical body someplace else, they would be totally unknown to us. You, would, you probably have walked up to somebody at the shop right or something and said, you please hurry, uh, i got to get out of here. And you're talking to your mom, your grandmother. Granny Swope has died, she came back, she's, she's checking things out at the shop right, and you're yelling at her. But there is a way of communicating light to light that you will know without a shadow of a doubt, and they'll know without a shadow of a doubt. Now let's go back just once again and look at the Apostle Paul's statement. Okay. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I be known as I am known. Now, now I know in part. You know, did you ever say, sometimes I think I saw something. Uh, what I think I saw something out of the corner of my eye. It's always out of the corner of your eye if you notice that. But I mean, I think I saw something. 
We're never quite sure. Say, I think there was a light. Did anybody see a bright light? No, I saw a light. But then face to face, I mean, this is the same. Here's contact that there's no question about. You will know in the same way that you were known in the realm of light, not in the realm of flesh and blood and English names in a totally new realm of the invisible. So we have to learn. We have to be instructed. Because we've been driven off the edge of the cliff by religion and the lunatic things we've been taught since the time we've been kids. If you want to meet those who have passed on face to face, then you have to do it in these terms. But how? Face to face. Can you, can you, can you think of that? Face to face. Think of your grandmother, your brother, your sister, or whoever they are, face to face. Now let me show you a scripture from the ancient patriarch of the Bible, Jacob. Whoa. <laughs> that must be an omen of something. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face. Uh-huh. See? I didn't, go, I didn't have to go out of the Bible to find this. Paul said, now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, Jacob, thousands of years before, said, I have seen God face to face, and it was at the pineal. Face to face, and he calls the place Peniel. Now, Peniel, P-E-N-I-E-L, of the Bible, is spelled differently than Peniel, P-I-N-E-A-L, of the brain. But we're talking about something that's thousands of years old. So, I mean, you know, the change there could be reasonably accepted, but that's not good enough for us, right? We shouldn't. I don't want you to come in and say, well, yeah, Bill said, yeah, it's plenty old, but I mean, yeah, maybe they changed the name after all these 5,000 years. No, that's not good. The only way that we can determine if that pineal is the same pineal, P-A-N-E-A-L, is not to ponder the spelling of the word, but to take the scripture, compare it with the action of the gland in your head. What are we told in scripture? Now, let's learn. Now, keep in mind that what we reference God as the invisible force is beyond the realm of the physical body. Okay, let me see. Okay, first one, John. First Corinthians, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Okay? Now, next we're going to determine what's face to face. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light. So we are going to see, or we are going to know this light face to face with certainty. Okay? How are, see, how are we going to, yeah, God is light, and we're going to see into this realm face to face. Now how are we going to do this? Next. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face. Thus in this biblical event, Great light is seen face to face. This is the point here. Jacob, in this story, saw the great light face to face, and with this great light coming into him, he called it Peniel. Okay? Now, is the Peniel of the Bible the same as the Peniel in the brain? Keeping in mind the references to light. God is light, face-to-face, -face, pineal. Keeping those in mind, let's go to the encyclopedia. The retina detects the light and directly signals and entrains the suprachrismatic nucleus. Fibers project from the suprachrismatic nucleus to the paraventricular nuclei, which relay the circadian signals to the spinal cord and out via the sympathetic system to superior cervical ganglia and from there into the pineal gland. What I have just read from the encyclopedia says there is a connection 
that the Bible and science are right in tune. I am going to see this face to face. I am going to see the light face to face. And I am going to call this place Peniel. And the retina detects the light, which is then sent on to the Peniel. So there we make the connection. Let's look at the next one. And this is the connection. God is light. The pineal gland is a light receptor, which you just saw it. And Jacob sees the light face to face and calls the place pineal. So if we are created in the image and likeness of God, then we are light inside of a physical body. Which means that those who have passed on, our loved ones, are available to us in the realm of light and the way that one contacts or is contacted is via the activation of the pineal gland of the brain. That's where it happens. That's how it happens. Okay? You can't pray it. Okay? You don't have to go in and sit on a room with a board. Or a, you, it has to come through that activation electronically in the middle of your brain in the pineal gland. The pineal, being situated near the set of the forehead, is also referred to as the third eye or the single eye. Okay? So what does the Jesus of the Bible say that will kind of firm up this whole thing and document it for us? Matthew 6.22, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye be single, your whole body shall be full of light. Jacob says... I have seen God face to face. He has seen the light face to face. He calls it pineal. Jesus says, if your eye be single, if you activate the pineal, your whole body shall be filled with light. And there, there, there is something else that I think I just want to add for you here. It has to do with our, our meditation. Look at the next one. Pineal gland, Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia. The production of melatonin by the pineal gland is stimulated by darkness and inhibited by light. In other words, it shuts down. The pineal gland becomes active when it's dark. Thus, this following scripture confirms our meditation techniques and the fact that Jacob's pineal is indeed your pineal. Watch what Jesus says. The people who sat in darkness saw great light. You understand how now? It takes darkness to open up the third eye. When that opens up, then you receive that which is the light, which is the invisible. So, the people who sat in darkness, as we do in this meditative process, in the dark, the pineal opens up and the great light will come. Now, the point is you've got to stop messing around with it and stop saying, well, forget it. Be like the little child and say, I, 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 tell you, I saw it, I don't care, whatever. You know. Be, get involved in it. Now, the purpose of all of this that we've gone through this evening is considering the children studied by Drs. Tucker and Stevenson, who spoke of past lives. But mainly, my personal search is in overcoming a most terrible situation, which in reality has been caused almost totally by religion, and that is the loss of contact with our families. The loss of contact with our friends whose bodies gave out and, 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 and as far as we know, uh, they're pretty much gone into oblivion because we don't know because we've been so misled and, 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 and screwed up in our heads by religion. This is not how it should be. This is not how nature intended it to be. Their light personalities and persons are just as vibrant and recognizable as ever. 
Just think of somebody, an uncle, an aunt, a person, who, whomever. Think of that person whose body gave out and they're into this realm that I'm talking about. Think of them because religion has scared us away from them. But we ourselves in accepting these religious superstitions have lost the ability to communicate with them and be open to their communicating with us. I wanted to... I wanted to, uh, to comment on something. Uh, Al Cruz raised the point last week. And I think, it, I think it, was, it was well made. He brought something to my attention when we were talking about these children in their past lives. And especially with this, this kid that had the uh, birthmark on the chest and the doctors found that uh, when in his past life he had been shot. Al Cruz uh, brought this, and, and we've talked about it, and we, we looked at this earlier by, uh, from Dr. Stevenson and, and, and the University of, of Virginia. Would you show that once again? Uh, and this is, this is the situation, okay? The boy uh, has a birthmark, and they find out that in a previous life he had been shot in, in the chest. Say, now, the point that Al raised is one that I've declared over and over again. What happens when a bad person is executed. We ignorantly think we have killed that person. Somebody shot this guy and thought he's dead forever, but he's not. He's back here and he's got the wound to prove it. So what happens to, to these uh, to these rapists and, and bombers and people who do all these terrible things and we execute them and, and unfortunately what we have done is not killed that person, we've destroyed the body. We have simply set that corrupted mind free to return in another body and subject another innocent person to the same violence. And so throughout the eons of thousands of years, over and over and over again, there are the same killers and the same rapists and the same evil. It repeats itself because we never take the evil and sit with it. We've got it in jail. We've got it controlled. It can't go anywhere. And we can work with it and work with it and work with it and drive that evil out of the mind. We've got enough years to do it. And by the time that person is feeble and old and so on, it's gone. And then that person doesn't become a threat. But we, we dispatch them at the, at the zenith of their evilness. And they're back. And this is what Dr. James Tucker, who is an associate of Dr. Ian Stevenson at the University of Virginia, had to say about this. So, After reviewing many of the strongest cases we have, the best explanation for them is that memories and emotions at times seem to be able to carry over from one life to the next. So I think the evidence is there to support reincarnation. Now, if you're asking, is it part of my personal belief system? Not particularly. I'm not a Buddhist or a Hindu or anything like that. I'm open to the possibility, obviously, or I wouldn't be spending time on this research. So w what happens to these people that you think you have killed. They enter another body just like these kids do, and just like he's talking to, and you've got the same old stuff back again. And then you have little kids who, uh, uh, who, who like, uh, I forget that, who was that Jeffrey Dahmer? Remember? The guy used to eat bodies and all this crazy stuff. You know how he started? Taking animals apart when he was a little kid. He had been killed in a previous life, and it was still the same person. And he started as a little kid, and nobody ever caught it as a little kid. And he just grew, and it grew, and the, the evil. So ignorant people that pull the switch and order the switch to be pulled are subjecting many, many people in the future to be slaughtered and raped and killed by the same evil. Here's a college professor doctor, scientist, who has studied and documented so many of these instances saying they make a strong case for reincarnation. He can't get out in the public and say that. He'll be ridiculed just like William Crooks was. And yet we execute the most violent and sadistic people, thinking that's the end of them. When in reality, it's just setting them free to prey on others. 
And we do this because we do not understand what life is and how it works. We really don't. That is why I brought you scientists and scholars to comment on the reality of life that will counter the absurd superstitions of religion. Let me, let me, let me just uh, refresh you with a few. Here's Dr. Uh, Vin Pan Lomo. I, I, I forget where he's from, but near-death experiences can only be explained if you assume that consciousness is located outside the brain. Okay. Now, you, who do you want to listen to, him or Jerry Falwell? Do you know what? <laughs> yeah, you laugh? Overwhelmingly, the majority of people listen to Jerry Falwell. But they're unconscious. <laughs> but but in, 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 in their way, they do such damage. Let us, um, let us look at uh, Olaf Blanc of Geneva University. Neurologist Olaf Blanc of Geneva U University Hospital in Switzerland. We have representations of our entire body that can bis be disassociated from our real body. You may not understand all, but you get, you get what he's talking about. Well, maybe he doesn't know either. Maybe he's, maybe he's a radical, maybe he's a cult leader. I, I, I really don't think so. Huh? How about Jerry Gilmore from uh, Cambridge University? There are the first properties other than existence that we've been able to determine. In other words, he has actually looked at things that don't exist. You can do with that? Well, he must belong to a cult, Cambridge University cult in England. Oh, jeez. How about the Oxford University cult, David Deutsch? There is no moment when your unseen counterparts can no longer affect you. David Deutsch. The University of Pennsylvania cult, represented by Professor Max Tegmark. There are infinitely many other inhabited planets, including not just one, but infinitely many that have people with the same appearance, name, and memories as you, who play out every possible permutation of your life choices. Now, he does, he does look like a cult leader, I would... Yeah, I, <laughs> Because Pastor so and so wouldn't approve, would never say that. Only difference between Pastor so and so and Max Tegmark is he's educated and understands what reality is. And then there is Professor Paul Steinhardt, who is head of the Einstein uh, classes at uh, Princeton University. He definitely looks like a cult leader. For years, parallel universes were a staple of the twilight zone. Serious scientists dismissed all the speculation as absurd, but now it seems the speculation wasn't absurd enough. Parallel universes really do exist, and they are much stranger than even the science fiction writers dared to imagine. He's the head of the Einstein studies at Princeton University in Princeton, New Jersey. What are you going to do with it? These are, these are the people, these are the sources that I have used to tell you all this stuff. Next statement is from a scientist by the name of George Meek. For the first time in 8,000 years of recorded history, it can now be said with certainty that our mind, memory, personality, and soul will survive physical death. Who is he? George Meek. He's a scientist, and I forget exactly where he's from. Now, how does he know that? I didn't see him on the David Letterman show, did you? I didn't see him on Fox News. See what goes on? They know. Who do they talk? They talk amongst themselves. Who do people listen to? Do they listen to these scientists and doctors who have proved contact through science? No. This is who we listen to. And we flock by the millions to listen to them. There they are. Yeah, these are the these are the boys. We bow before them. We fill their coffers with millions of dollars, and they don't know a damn thing about anything. How can you even for a minute place these characters on the same level with the David Deutsch or the Max Tegmark or the George Meek or Paul Steinhardt? You can't, and yet that's our authority. And you wonder why everybody's blowing each other up. Because they're listening to these fools. 
But you know, these people have something going for them that the scientists don't. Fear. They've built their careers on fear. And they have gotten the overwhelming majority of people to uh, deal with it in a way that says, oh, don't, uh, don't let anything happen to me. I'm scared. But here now is a situation that uh, I wanted to, I, I'm a little bit messed up with my stuff here, but I think it's in the next. Where do these true things really go? Where do contact with people who have passed over go, really go on? What? Victor Zavitt. This guy's a lawyer who works in, in this type of research and did a lot of studies on the work of William Crooks. It is highly evidential in that the contact is repeatable and is occurring in laboratories throughout the world and is being subjected to close scientific scrutiny. And you don't know anything about it. You go to church and you bow down and you put your hat on and you take your hat off and you have smoke thrown in your face and you got water and the people singing, this is the day that the Lord has made. And these guys are in some laboratories at the basement of some place and they're making contact with Granny Swope. And it's true. It's going on. This is the pathetic part of the story. We have chosen to follow the ones who do not know and chosen to disregard the statement of those who do know. Now, we're going to wrap it up, but there's just one something I wanted to show you because Albert, many years ago, I mean, he, he, he showed me something and it's, and it's true and he confirmed it for me. He was a scientist when he was working. And he says you put everything under the microscope. So I've got to put everything under the microscope with you just in case. I'm not saying this is anything, but we have all been eagerly awaiting the explosion of supernova 1987A as predicted to occur in 2005 by NASA. Of course, as you know, it did not occur, so we're waiting. But NASA said it. I mean, it's, not, it's a credible institution. This is supernova 1987A. The thing that is of interest to me, and I just want to, because I'm not sure about it, but I'm just throwing it out in front of you. The thing that is interesting to me is whether a message has been sent, I don't know. This supernova 1987A is in the form of what is called Visica Piscis, okay, which is two interlocking circles which have that third circle in the center. Let me show you the, the Visica Piscis right now. There it is. Okay? Now, the reason that I am showing this to you, and then, then we're done. There is an appearance in Italy in a place called Gallo Piemonte Province on May 26, 2006. And this is it. It's an appearance of the Vesica Piscis. Okay? And uh, now, as I said, maybe somebody did make that with a board. I, I don't know. But if they didn't, and if this uh, just happened, then it could be a sign. Maybe it's not, but it, I'm just telling you in advance, it could be the possibility of a sign that